Hello, I'm Eric Snodgrass, and thank you for watching today's Ag Forecast brought to you by Nutrient Ag Solutions, your premier platform for real-time global insights. We're looking across the globe here over the last seven days. We're looking at the last seven days in terms of temperature anomalies, and we can see how brutally cold things were across the eastern half of North America. Now, looking at this overall pattern, there's a few things we got to address in this video. I think the clues in the changes in our forecast are going to show up in three areas. One, what will be happening here in parts of Russia and Siberia? Two, Two, what is the influence of the warm water that is still in parts of the North Pacific and the lack of sea ice in the Chukchi Sea and the warming in the Bering Sea? How will that influence our pattern moving forward? And finally, we need to keep a close eye on Greenland because as we slide into the end of November and start the month of December, the big questions we have is the pattern that we're in going to continue to be persistent. In other words, warm west dry west with unsettled conditions and much colder to the east. Now, speaking of the cold to the east, yes, we set a lot of record low temperatures over the last couple of days in the eastern part of the U.S., but I at least want to show you something neat here from satellite. This is an animation just yesterday afternoon kind of coming right off of the east coast right here in the mid-Atlantic, and you can see the cloud streets that have evolved. This is a neat feature that happens when cold air goes blasting off the east coast, and the thing I really like about it is right in here in our bays, we actually have what look like lake effect snow no bands, but it's really ocean effect clouds from the warm water that sits in the bay there with the cold air that's over the top of it. Just a neat thing to see here whenever that cold air goes racing off the east coast. Here's another thing to see, kind of going to the other side of the country here in the northwest. I've been talking for, it feels like the last 10 days or so, about the very uh, stagnant air pattern we've seen across the northwest, and you can see it here in this satellite animation. That low-level fog is trapped beneath a strong inversion due to a big upper-level ridge that sits over the area, and it's really occupying much of the Willamette Valley there uh, just south of Portland and then almost all of the Columbia Basin yesterday. A very cool satellite animation. Okay, is that pattern changing? That's one of the big questions we're going to try to answer. First of all, what's our Pacific jet stream doing? It is certainly still split here across the Pacific Ocean getting into parts of the uh, Pacific Northwest and that's going to keep the more stagnant pattern around here. But one question we're going to ask is, are we going to be getting any substantial rain for the Pacific Northwest and for California? Second question, how long is this upper level trough here going to stick around and what's it going to be doing to North American temperatures? And I think finally we're going to talk about this little guy right down here moving right along the Gulf Coast, setting things up after the end of our weekend for an active pattern that runs up the East Coast like this, which we may see repeat itself in week two again. So these are the big features. Let's get right on into it by taking a look at our all hazards weather map. It is so nice to see this map not really colorful. We just have uh, stagnant air warnings here. This is a dense fog advisory and as this system finally curls up here just off the coast we will be seeing very windy conditions but outside of that much of the rest of the country is looking relatively benign in terms of the overall um, you know hazardous weather threat so what are the big changes? Well, I got four big updates to give you here. First of all, as I animate this in a few moments, I want you to see that the position of the polar vortex, which over the next five days will be moving such that it will be along this axis, has changed because before we had this big colder outbreak, it was weakening and its axis was like this. You can see that as I animate this forward, that that change over the next five days will be shifting where the coldest axis of air is across the northern hemisphere. And as we get out to day 10, take a look at where we expect the polar vortex position to be. Now, given that, what this is going to do across the, well, the northern hemisphere is shove a whole lot more of our cold air over into this area, stretching basically from Japan all the way to, you know, parts of Eastern Europe. That is a large expanse of some very cold air. And while that happens, that allows for the temperature patterns across North America to, I say, relax a little bit. We still maintain, because of the warm water here, more ridging out in the Western United States and broader troughing over the East, which is why you do see the cooler pattern throughout the six to 10 day time period. But at least the coldest air on Earth is no longer here it is now sitting on this side of the planet okay so that's one big change that we're going to be seeing by the way at the end of this video i'm going to give you a full update on south america as well so stick around for that at the end third thing i want you to see here over the next 10 days we're looking here at the per uh, uh, precipitation anomalies from the operational european model and i think the big features to be on the lookout for is an active pattern just off the east coast drier in the interior 
a cutoff low setting up over Southern California. And even though you see drier conditions in the Pacific Northwest, we will be bringing in rainfall and some snow into this area. So we have to ask ourselves, how do we get into this pattern and what does it mean for harvest efforts in the midsection of the United States? What does it mean for the first possible rainfall event in California since May? And do any of these systems along the East Coast to actually get close enough to cause some problems? We're gonna to get to all of that. One thing I do wanna point out though, and this is my major update number four, in the near term, I don't see any major snowfall events racing through the midsection of the United States toward the Northeast. The pattern we are set up in, well, this is a map that shows you the next 10 days in terms of the probability of getting three inches of snowfall. And that pattern I mentioned here is just not one that is conducive to a lot of big low pressure systems that come out of the Rocky Mountains and race just like this. So that is a big difference, which is gonna be important for harvest efforts in the midsection of the United States. Okay, some of the details. With that cold polar air that was pushed into this area and was sitting right here, I mean, we saw temperatures below zero in the northern part of that circle I just drew. Well, as the winds shifted on Wednesday, that cold air retreated back north and actually blew over the top of our Great Lakes producing lake effect snow bands, which actually were oriented south to north. And that's a rare thing to see. But let me get those drawings off there and show you what happened in the overnight hours getting into early this morning. Light snow spread across parts of Michigan and then eventually over into parts uh, of, of eastern North America there but the big feature we're watching in the near term is coming out of kind of the boundary between the Gulf of Mexico here and Louisiana and Texas. By the time we get into late this afternoon, out ahead of this little cutoff low here, widespread precipitation going all the way from eastern Texas up to the Carolinas and even into Virginia, you'll see it spread through there. As I play you through Thursday afternoon, into Thursday evening. There we can see the widely scattered showers that are moving through this area, bringing in some slow moving rain uh, into this area. So the potential exists to pick up a better than an inch of rainfall over this time period. But also as I get into early Friday morning here, we see the tail end of a front that's actually from a system hitting Alaska, lashing here along coastal Oregon and Washington. Like I said, this region will be getting precipitation over the coming 10 days, but just compared to normal, it is not very much. So what happens is by Friday mid-morning, we see the rainfall finally trying to exit here off the east coast of the United States, such that by mid-afternoon on Friday, we're now going to watch this low kind of become a bit more organized just off the coast before it goes moving toward the northeast. What are we left with over here in this part of like the cotton belt, peanut belt? And we'll grow a lot of sweet potatoes and corn and soybeans in here as well. Well, we just have some widely scattered showers left over. Meanwhile, if I just step you back, Friday midday moving through the Columbia Basin into the the northern part of Idaho and Montana, some rainfall is expected to move through that area. So midsection of the U.S. though, relatively dry through your next three days here, okay? Let's switch over to the European model to see where we go from there. We'll pause it right here. This is Friday evening. Now let's get into Saturday morning. So that was round number one coming through the northwest. That's our upper level low sitting and spinning off the coast heading up to the northeast. In the midsection of the U.S., some windy conditions with some southerly winds. You can see that, right? Here is the position of the high. And with the flow around it being clockwise, it's coming right up out of this area. Some, some stronger winds out of the south here in the day on Saturday. Now, what we're watching on Saturday is with that return of those southerly winds, maybe some widely scattered showers stretching from Colorado all the way up here to parts of Minnesota. And as we get into our weekend, we're watching another big push of moisture that comes through the Pacific Northwest. Sunday afternoon, maybe some snow for northern parts of Wisconsin and Minnesota. And we do have the chance right in here and through the middle for some scattered rain showers. But again, this isn't one of those organized low pressure systems. This is just return moisture out of the Gulf of Mexico. Now, once I get you out past Monday, watch the changes in the overall pattern. Monday morning, getting into Tuesday morning. What do we see? Just a weak low pressure system skirting along the US-Canada border and to its south, maybe pressing through the Dakotas Monday night into Tuesday morning, getting over to Minnesota and Iowa, some light rainfall, all right? But the biggest change in the overall pattern will be what happens on the East Coast and on the West Coast. You see, at this time, we're gonna be watching another coastal low. This again is next Tuesday night, getting into Wednesday morning, going up the East Coast. And at the same time that's occurring, a deeper cutoff low is setting up here over California. And as I play this forward, you see while the midsection's left out of the game here, 
we see a big system that goes up and is currently forecast to be relatively close to the east coast of the United States, hence the bigger snows in the interior and the heavy rains and very windy conditions here just off the east coast while a deeper trough establishes over California and, like I said, bringing in some precipitation to some parts of California that haven't seen rainfall since May. So this is now next Wednesday evening. I'm going to stop there with an operational model because we've got to switch over to the ensembles to get the real bigger picture here, okay? So week one, GFS on the left, European on the right, they are in lockstep with precipitation anomalies. Like we said, more or less uneventful in this section of the country with our system sneaking through here and then going up the east coast over the next five days okay so that's pattern number one or for this week here's two second week gfs left european ensemble right at this point the models have completely different ideas about what the pattern is going to be the european model with a more elongated trough hanging around longer look at the wetter conditions here Whereas the GFS with a deeper trough that pushes into Eastern North America keeps this the more active corridor. Now, we need to see the model differences so we can make a judgment on which model more than likely has this pattern down. So what we're gonna do is, on the left, GFS ensemble. On the right, European ensemble. And we're looking here at 500 millibar heights, which tells us where our troughs and ridges are located. Now, over the last few days, the GFS on the left has come into much better agreement with the European, which again is on the right, on the position of this trough. Remember I told you that the GFS was too progressive with it? Well, it finally slowed it down and brought it in place. So we look pretty good through the weekend. Getting into early next week is where the model differences begin to show up. Now, initially, the GFS is much deeper with the trough that's sitting here off of the southwest coast and much deeper with the trough that's over the southeast. So that is gonna keep the eastern part of the US colder, and with that deeper trough, it's gonna allow for a bigger low pressure system to race up the east coast in the GFS compared to the Euro. Both models are picking up on the wave breaking event. That's this ridge going over the top of this trough. Both very good about at least the, the strength and position of that. But look at the differences as I get you out into Tuesday. You see the GFS much stronger trough over the eastern half of North America. And that trough there is going to keep things much colder than the European. The European slows things down a bit and allows the trough over uh, California to become deeper. See it here? Whereas the GFS really wants to favor a much deeper east coast system. So the models are kind of battling over coasts. Which one's going to have the stronger system where? And the European is favoring that deeper trough west while the GFS is favoring it east. And we're gonna see what that means in terms of temperatures in a few moments, but it means everything for the progression of the pattern. See, I got you now out to next Friday, this is the 22nd, and the European says, hang on, slow this pattern down, keep this trough in place, stagnate things across the central United States, warm things up. The GFS says, nope, let's just drop in more cold air right here, really chilling things out as we now get into next weekend, not this coming, but next weekend. And that is the big difference as we finish out the month. The GFS wanting to keep the cold bias in place, the European not so much. But I'll tell you this, the European out in the longer range has been flip-flopping a bit. Let me show you what I mean. Here is whoops, here is the temperature pattern through the next five days. Models are in lockstep on this pattern. Remember we talked about that. Day six through 10, remember what I said, the GFS much more aggressive with the troughing coming through here than the European is. So look at the European on the right, much less cold pattern than the GFS is. Both models agree the west coast of the United States still hangs on to its warm bias. Again, this is out to day 10. Now what about 11 to 15 day time period? Look at how much colder the GFS is than the European. But I'm gonna tell you something, the previous model run from the European was cold in here. So the European is kind of wavering a bit, and I think it's because it is struggling with the timing of this trough that's off the southwestern part of the United States. So that means we're going to have to watch this carefully because these two models are diverging from one another, and they're both bouncing around a little bit. So let's keep a close eye on this pattern because it tells us what to expect as we finish the month of November and get into December, okay? To finish this up, let's talk quickly about South America. This map shows you soybean production uh, per state or per municipality, excuse me, 
down in uh, Brazil. And what I want to show you is what things have looked like over the last 30 days. So you can pause it here if you want to take a closer look. But across Mato Grosso, we can certainly see that they are below trend on precipitation. That would be the top curve up here. Sliding down to Mato Grosso do Sul, also drier than average. Even though they've had some precip, it's been drier than average. Coming over here into eastern Brazil, so Goiás, Tocantins, that region, drier than average as well. That's what this graph is up here. And even sliding down into Paraná, we can still see that region drier than average, despite some recent heavier rainfall down in southern parts of Brazil. Rio Grande do Sul, that's about the only location that is right now showing above average precipitation. And that was because of some very wet conditions here over the last 20 days or so. That was what's kind of driven their precipitation patterns. Argentina overall, right on average in terms of precip totals. So this gives us the breakdown and here's the forecast. There is still a little bit of model inconsistency, GFS left, European right, but both models are in agreement that Mato Grosso is going to be seeing um, a greater than average precipitation with more than likely southern Brazil, northern Argentina showing up on the drier side of things here in the near term. Now what do South American farmers need to be on the lookout for? They need to watch these three regions specifically. I've put in yellow here in the arrows that you see over parts of Brazil and parts of Argentina, Uruguay, and Paraguay. That is the ideal flow pattern to bring in normal Brazilian monsoon rainfall that also keeps parts of Argentina wet as well. What influences that are ocean temperatures in through here. What influences that is what goes on with the Mad Julian Oscillation and also what we're currently doing with the Indian Ocean Dipole. And we addressed all of this in our long range update the other day. But the things that we need to watch most carefully are these. The Indian Ocean Dipole has reached a peak and it is slowly expected to wane back toward normal by the time we get into January. Now what that means is that will largely control the position and strength of the Mad Julian Oscillation, which is a major influencer on the rainfall in South America. Next. Brazil tends to do well when ocean temperatures in here are cool, but we can see right now that they've been warming with time, that's this little bump right there, and we are anticipating ocean temperatures to possibly stay in the neutral, maybe with a slight warm bias as we progress through the early part of this winter. And what that spells is uncertainty in the precipitation patterns in South America, which means we're going to have to watch this one very carefully because with the late planted first crop beans, it will be critical precipitation at the end of December, beginning of January as they're going into pod filling time period uh, for the, well, the eventual production of the soybean crop and when we plant the corn and cotton, which will be the safrina crop. So we'll watch it all. Keep you updated right here at my.nutrientagsolutions.com. I will talk to you again very soon. Thank you.